You bow your heads with me in prayer, please. Lord, take our minds and think through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, how quickly we go from Merry Christmas to Happy New Year to Happy Epiphany. Yes, we are in another season already. Welcome to Grace Church, season of Epiphany. Those of you who know in the Episcopal Church and in many other churches, the tradition of Epiphany is a day to recognize the wise men or the magi as they were known, or sometimes as we not so correctly call them, the three kings. If you hadn't noticed, they have appeared at our nativity scene offering their gifts to the um, plastic baby Jesus. But uh, in good fun and good love, they are there at our nativity scene. And it is a story I'm sure that we all know. For some of you, it's 70 or 80 or 90 years of hearing the story. So you, you probably remember these wise men, as they're so called. The word in Greek is magus, and it really means magi. And so historians and theologians have come to a conclusion that they think is correct, that more than likely, coming out of the East, these would have been Zoroastrian priests. Any Zoroastrians here? No? That is basically the one god religion out of Persia, or what we now call mostly Iran. And so they would have been priests of their religion more likely, but also astronomers and scientists and biologists. They would have known much about the world and the outer world as it is. And so they were filled with knowledge and somehow came to find out about this king coming and they heard or saw that it would be near Jerusalem and so they made their way there talking with Herod, and of course Herod's like, oh, I could always use smart people. Um, why don't you go check on that for me? And, uh, and then I'll go pay homage. Of course, we all remember, I hope, that that was never Herod's intention to pay homage. He was sending them there on a fool's errand because he just wanted to know where is this king of the Jews so that he could remove him and not have any threat to his power. Of course, we know that the, the wise men, however many there were, ended up finding Jesus in Bethlehem and kneeling with these wonderful gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And of course, you may remember that from your pageants. I think the kids always wanted to hold the gold, right? right? The gold was the best because who knows what frankincense and myrrh are, right? Any of you? A few of you, maybe? I mean, frankincense, frank incense, so it's an incense. Myrrh is basically an embalming oil. And all of them would have been worthy gifts, expensive gifts to offer to a king. And then rising, they would have, of course, whatever this wisdom that they had, gone off back to their own country and thankfully not told Herod the bad news. It is used, as Paul alludes to in his story today in Ephesians, his letter, that it was a, a way of reminding us today epiphany, the unveiling, the appearance to the Gentile people. It is a way to remind us that God has decided this wasn't just for the Jewish people. It was for all of us. And that, of course, is the basic news, the good news. The reason you're here today is because this was unveiled for the entire world. But I would like to share a varied angle today. So varied, I need more water on my lips. A different reflection. And I offer this reflection to you today as a way to th think more deeply about what the Magi mean for us. I want you to imagine with me for a second the movement of the Magi. I want you to think for a second what they were doing. Wherever they came from in the east, and actually the east is this way. I saw the sun this morning. It's over there. They would have come somewhere from Persia or Arabia. And they would have journeyed. And they would have been reading their books or looking at the sky and figuring out about this king. And they would have journeyed more. We have another word for journey. The word is process. They would process on their way from wherever they came in the east to Jerusalem. Filled with this knowledge of this king of the Jews, they would have gotten there. They would have, of course, with all their knowledge and power as priests, gone right to King Herod and said, King Herod, we've heard about this king. And we wonder if you know, since he is king of the Jews, where he might be. We follow this star, but we can't exactly perfectly GPS it. Our tongue's on is not working. Cheap laugh. Come on. <laughs> and 
And they would have been in Jerusalem talking to Herod and his chief priests and his scribes, and the journey would have been long. They would have processed a very long way. And they would have figured out, wow, that's it. And so they were suggested to just take that small journey. It's a journey actually in two and a half weeks that I will make myself from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. It's only a few miles. And they would have gone to Bethlehem and they would have seen the star in the sky. By the way, side note. You ever notice the blue over the altar in churches? The reason why that is blue is it represents the heavens. Because it represents Mary. Because Mary gave birth to God, the king of the heavens. That's why it's blue. And so they would have come under the starry sky to the sky filled with this star and they would have said, oh my, here he is. They would have processed, come to Jerusalem, and made this extra small journey. Do you know what they did? Do you remember the words? They kneeled before the Christ child. And in such praise and thanksgiving, they offered gifts to him. Maybe gifts he didn't know about, maybe gifts he didn't need, but worthy and expensive gifts. But they also offered themselves in homage to this king, this powerful being before them. Having spent this time in homage and probably talking with Mary and gazing and adoringly in awe at who this baby was, they would have done something else, wouldn't they? What do we hear at the end of the story? They went home. We have a word for that in church. It's called recession. Not recession as in bad economics, but in movement out to where you came from. It is my suggestion, my brothers and sisters, that this moment, Epiphany, when the Magi first came, they processed to Jerusalem and to Bethlehem, this was in fact the first Christian act of liturgy. This was the first moment when those who were not Jewish made a movement to come to the Christ child and bow at his feet. It starts with procession. It starts with that movement to come to where they had heard Christ came. And every one of you did the same thing today. You knew we would talk about Christ today. Some of you may have been nervous coming for the first or second time. Maybe some of you were invited, but you came. You knew that Jesus Christ would be preached here. And you came. You processed here. There's a theologian I'd like to read some of his words who talks about this. As we tease out this idea. The liturgy of the Eucharist is best understood as a journey or a procession. It is the journey of the church into the dimension of the kingdom of God. We use the word dimension because it seems the best way to indicate the manner of our sacramental entrance into the risen life of Christ. Color pictures come alive when viewed in three dimensions instead of two. The presence of the added dimension allows us to see much better the actual reality of what has been photographed. In very much the same way, though of course, as I've said before, any analogy is always condemned to fail, our entrance into the presence of Christ is an entrance into a fourth dimension, which is allows us to see the ultimate reality of life. It is not an escape from the world, rather it is the arrival at a vantage point from which we can see more deeply into the reality of the world. Do you hear that? The idea that we are processing into the midst of this place to meet Christ allows us to more fully see the truth and reality of the world in which we live in four dimensions. But the journey begins when Christians, you and I, leave their homes and their beds. They leave indeed their life in this present concrete world and whether they have to drive 15 or 20 miles or walk a few blocks or a few feet, a sacramental act is already taking place. An act which is the very condition of everything else that is to happen here. For they are now on their way to constitute the church or to be more exact, to be transformed into the church of God. They've been called to come together in one place to bring their lives, their very world with them, and to be more than what they were, a new community with a new life. 
The purpose of this coming together is not simply to add just a religious dimension to the natural community or to make it better or more responsible or more Christian. The purpose is to fulfill the church. And that, makes, that means to make present the one in whom all things are at their end and all things are at their beginning. Did you know that was going to happen when you woke up this morning? Many of us do travel a distance, some many distances of miles, many 15, 20, 30 miles. Some of us a few blocks. It's all the same. Some of you have been to churches in other parts of the state or the country. You've gone long distances for weddings and funerals. Some of you may have been blessed like I to have traveled to other countries and gone to worship in places like a church I went to in Nepal where there were people from like 40 countries worshiping in the same space from all over the world. And all of it is the same as what we're doing here. We come to fulfill and build the community of God, his body, the church. The purpose then of this procession and journey is to become church. That's why we process. That's why we have liturgy. Some of you may be new to this church or the Episcopal Church. You know that the Episcopal Church comes out of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church comes out of what would be called the Orthodox Church. All of them are heavily influenced by liturgy. Some of us, especially if we're of the Catholic background may have gotten tired of the kneeling and standing and praying and crossing. And some of us don't understand. But every part of it has a purpose. The reason we process in at the beginning, whether it's a short one or a long one, is to remind us of what you've just done from your bed to the church. That each one of us has processed. We replay it. We have come together and that processional is to remind us symbolically in our hearts and minds and souls that we have done that together. But it begins with that procession. Liturgically, something amazing happens next. Just like the Magi processed across the land and ended up in Jerusalem and then Bethlehem, they came where? Before the Christ child. And in a way, they were doing the same thing that we do now. What do we start with? We read and hear the scriptures. Hopefully, you get a half-decent sermon, breaking down the word and opening it up to you to make it more full, to make it more understandable. Then we confirm our faith. Then we pray. Then we ask for forgiveness and are absolved. You see, what we're doing in this whole section of the liturgy, the beginning part, is preparing our hearts for Christ opening our hearts and having him come in and break down everything out there. Why? So we can fulfill church. And why do you need to be cleansed? Because we carry so much with us. And God wants us before him in his presence to be as unhindered, as unsinful, as unbroken as possible. And so we prepare ourselves during that procession, during that journey, and we come and we prepare. I'd like to read a little bit more from our theologian. As we proceed further in the Eucharistic liturgy, the time has now come to offer to God the totality of our lives, of ourselves, of the world in which we live. This is the first meaning of our bringing to the altar the elements of food. Right before our Eucharist, you will see a couple of our invited friends to bring up the bread and the wine, preceded by, of course, what? The offering of your financial gifts. We know that we were created as celebrants of the sacramental life, of its transformation into life in God, communion in God. We have come to become the church, my brothers and sisters. And what is the church? The body of Christ. In the body of Christ, you dwell in and with him. We know that real life is Eucharist, which just means thanksgiving. It's a movement of love and adoration toward God. The movement in which alone the meaning and the value of all that exists can be revealed and fulfilled. We know, you know, I know, that we have lost this Eucharistic life. And finally know that in Christ, the new Adam, the perfect man, this Eucharistic life was restored to man. For he himself was the perfect Eucharist. 
he offered himself in total obedience, love, and thanksgiving to God. God was his very life, and he gave this perfect and Eucharistic life to us. In him, God became our life, and thus this offering to God of bread and wine, of that food we must eat in order to live, is our offering to him of ourselves, of our life, and of the world. When those magi processed across great distances, risking injury and death, and ending up on their knees before the Christ child, they offered gifts of themselves. They offered their lives to this king of kings. My brothers and sisters, you do the same thing every Sunday. And if you didn't know you were doing it, now you do. Liturgy has purpose. We may forget about it, we may not like it, but deep within our souls something is happening as we draw into the presence of Christ and God. And so the story of the Magi, I think, can be seen as the first Christian liturgical act in the world. 2019 years ago, the Magi set forth a template for what we do every Sunday and every other day that we worship. It is one of the reasons why I always hope you're here on Sunday. Not because you're not beautiful and lovely and I I miss you. Not because we need your money or your time or your talent. But because I truly believe that when you walk through the liturgy, you come closer to Christ and we become the community of God. And that's what we do here on Sunday. Now, at the end of the story... The Magi get up, don't they? There's one more thing you have to do. All of this is beautiful and wonderful and astounding that God would give us a mechanism to come into his presence at his table to offer our financial gifts, the bread and wine, and even ourselves as we kneel before him. But that's not enough, is it? We must get up and go out those doors and share that light and that love and that community. There is a warning in the story. Maybe you missed it. Do you remember when Herod is talking to his priests and his scribes? These are Jewish priests and scribes. Do you recognize the conversation about the Messiah who has come into the world? And do you see who goes to see the Messiah? Not the Jewish priests and scribes, but priests from another land who don't even know who he is. The warning, my brothers and sisters, is that you must fully go yourself. Being spiritual but not religious is not gospel. That is a half-watered-down measure. That is attempting to do something which you're not, which is saying, I can meet God anywhere else, but I don't have to go to church at all. You don't really, do you? You can talk to God in your car or your bathroom or at work or on the airplane, but do you see here? We do it together as community in the midst of the liturgy. And this warning is, it's kind of like if the second coming of Christ, if we found out about the second coming of Christ and he was going to Bethlehem, Connecticut, ironically there's a Bethlehem, Connecticut, and if we were all told Jesus is coming to Bethlehem, Connecticut, and none of you wanted to go, and we picked three Muslims or Jewish people and said, you go check out our Lord and Savior. Why would you do that? We must go to Christ ourselves. We must process and prepare our hearts before Christ ourselves. We must kneel before Christ ourselves and offer the totality of our being. If God so loved the world that he gave his only son that we could be saved through him, then everything you have, literally everything you have, is from God. When we process into church, what are we doing? We are giving everything back to God. And we do it in Eucharist, which is thanksgiving. Kneeling before Christ and saying, thank you, God, for everything you have given me. I am yours totally. This is the church of God. This is the community of God. Remember, in him was life, and his life was the life of the world. Now we're just offering it back to him in praise and thanksgiving through the liturgy, through the Eucharist, that God may be glorified in all things as we are drawn back to him in Christ. 
drawn back into the love of God. And in that moment, love is restored as the very life of the world in you and in me, and then taken out to share with everyone we know, now and forever. Amen.